Welcome to the Metaphysical Martini Show, where wit and wisdom come together to bridge the gap between the spirit realm and the physical world. With Ani Abadisian, the Suburban Shaman, a production of Cosmic Reality Radio. Hello everyone, it's Ani Abadisian. Welcome to Metaphysical Martini. Three parts spirit, one part rational mind, two drops of optimism, give it all a good hard shake and pour. Dress it with the olives of grace and empathy, sip slowly and contemplate the wonder of cosmic creation. What should we talk about this week? What's been bothering all the people who walk through my door? Well, I think the clear winner this week is a sense of powerlessness. And by that I mean peeps feel they have little or no control over their lives. They don't know how to go about motivating themselves, let alone influencing the collective consciousness to move towards a, a safer society, a kinder society, a simpler society, one with less distraction, one where everyone's voice is heard and all opinions are considered. I think every other person I see, and I've been doing this job a very long time, over four decades or so, every other person I see has some level of depression and some level of escapist addiction, whether it's booze or drugs or food, or a fixation on some, you know, some other potentially harmful behaviour. It seems a great many of us feel we're, uh, well, overpopulated. That's come up. Undereducated, well, that's been around a while. And, you know, people are beginning to realize for the first time that all aspects of their lives are manipulated and micromanaged by whatever we choose to call the man, the establishment. So, what's the point, say the people, of living as a hamster on the eternal wheel of woe? All we do is eat, poop, work, sleep, and repeat. We become slaves in our own co creation. You know, that sounds depressing, doesn't it? I mean, it really does. It's sad. But if we're honest, that is how many people today would describe their lives. So let's take a look at some of that and let's try to sort some of it out, shall we? Because, you know, we're cosmic co-creators, or that's what we're supposed to be. So why are we all stuck in a rut? Why are we all so depressed? Ah! Oh! Right, let's take a look at some of those things. Overpopulation. Well, are we overpopulated? Well, well, yes, of course we are, but only because we don't manage our resources properly. We could easily feed 7 billion plus people by changing our production and consumption habits, couldn't we? I mean, it's not going to happen overnight because, well, first, we need to acknowledge that we have a problem and then we need to agree on a series of solutions. But we can make a start. We should make a start because overpopulations come up for the first time you know, in what I call common talk for a very long time. So, hurrah. It's a big, big subject. It's so big, I won't go into great detail today. But I will remind us all that historically, food has been used time and time again as a weapon. And if we don't want to be held hostage by the self-serving sociopaths who run this planet, it's an issue we should address sooner than later. The second part of this, of course, is what type of food we want to eat or what type of food we should be eating. I mean, one of the examples, the biggest example in my opinion, we grow cereals and we give this cereal to livestock. So we grow the cereals, we feed it to the livestock and then we eat the livestock. I have to say, <laughs> on many levels, you know, I don't approve, but on, on, on the main level, it's inefficient, isn't it? I mean, all that arable land and all that water used to feed animals so that they can be fed to us. I mean, if we reduce our meat consumption by even, what, 50%, it would make a huge impact on future generations. And, and don't get me even started on how we pollute the oceans. I mean, it's not even safe to eat the fish anymore. And if you eat, you know, wild caught fish and it, it's like $36 a pound. I mean, who could afford all that stuff? So food and population, managing the resources, they go together. You know, we, we, we should be able to have as many babies as we want if we can take care of them, but we can't. So what comes to mind when you hear the phrase plant-based diet? 
But what comes to mind for me is plants, you know, fruits, vegetables, corn, that sort of things. Things that grow in your garden or things that grow in your greenhouse, you pull them out of the soil, you wash them and you eat them. Not the factory-produced frankenfoods made up of these dozens of highly processed materials, which once upon a time came from plants. But please don't be fooled into thinking that those foods are a healthy choice and good for the planet, because they are not. Honestly, you might as well eat the cardboard boxes they come in. If we want to function as spiritually centred free thinkers, we need vitality. You know, prana, chi, that's vitality. And for that, we need dense nutrition, vitality in our cells. Highly processed food just does not cut it. And the less we depend on our local supermarkets for food supplies, the better off we will be in the long run, especially in times of crisis, natural or man-made. And both of those are escalating. Those of you who don't think that, you know, some of these earthquakes, etc., are man-made, oh boy, you know, you've got some catching up to do, okay? There's natural stuff too, but you've got some catching up to do if you don't think that the military are interfering with that sort of thing. Anyway, back to the overpopulation and the food thing. You know, I started researching urban gardening. I live in the suburbs, because, you know, I'm a suburban shaman, right? So I live in the suburbs, and we don't really have the capacity to grow our own food here. But when I started researching the urban gardening, and I did it primarily so that I would have an edible and nutrient-rich, you know, source of food in my emergency kit, uh, that's why I did it. But I was astonished when I researched how much food you could produce on a raised bed as small as four foot by four foot. And there are many homesteading websites out there, you know, that they'll really help you with excellent tutorials on how to grow, to preserve, to store food. It's much easier than you think. And, you know, I, I don't want to sound like an advertisement here, but it's an enjoyable family or community activity. And if you're going to grow vegetables and you're going to grow some of your own food, even some, I highly recommend buying heirloom seeds. They're also known as heritage seeds. They're the ones that reproduce true to form. And if you can go as organic as possible, of course, that's an added bonus. Let's start small, but let's make a start, all right? Because if we are going to keep popping out babies, we need to take control of how we nourish them. Look, your government doesn't care. I mean, your government doesn't even believe that you are entitled to sovereignty over your progeny. And until we wake up, all of us, and realize the importance and implications of sustainable food production and distribution, I say, if we can't feed it, let's not breed it. When we decide to have children, we're bringing in a fellow manifestation of source energy onto the planet. It deserves better than Lucky Charms cereal and Red Hot Cheetos and all the other rubbish. You know, I see people walking around with their prams, their children in the prams, and the child is holding a McDonald's bag of fries. Do you know what those fries are made of? I mean, there's a potato in there somewhere, but they're so saturated with pesticides so that they grow a certain shape um, and they're blemish-free, you might as well be dipping your child in toxins. I, I see this a lot, and it concerns me. It really does. So something to ponder, people. Population and the management of our resources. All right, what was next on the list? Uh, people are complaining about, uh, yeah, that, oh, we're undereducated, manipulated, and micromanaged. Well, yes, of course we are. I mean, you don't need a PhD in use your brainology to figure that out, do you? I mean, when it comes down to the education, I think the system, with a few exceptions, is really churning out obedient automatons and compliant consumers instead of free thinkers and cross-trained innovators. It's the cross-training, you know, we don't, we don't do that anymore. There's no breadth of subject. And yes, it does depend on where you live and it does depend on how much money you have and it does depend on how much interest you have in your child and the world, but on the whole, we don't do well in this country with cross-training our children. I mean, here's a little quiz, just off the top of your head. Anybody who's contemplating going to college, or anybody for that matter. And, you know, don't take this too seriously. This is not an admonishment or an... Just, can you answer these questions? Here we go. Can you name six classical philosophers? Can you name six living influential philosophers? But if I was to ask you to define squaring the circle, would you know what I was talking about? 
Do you have any idea the percentage of English words that have Latin roots? But Latin as an ancient Rome, by the way, not Latin America. Um, how many languages do you speak? What would you say are the qualities of a critical thinker? Can you name the five platonic solids? Where did the game of backgammon originate? What's the difference between rhetoric and dialectic? Can you define objectivism in under 30 minutes? <laughs> what year was ancient Rome founded? Which part of the brain is the one recognizes the emotional processing center? Who wrote the poem, Let America Be America Again? Lovely poem, that, by the way. Do you know the difference between Scotch and Bourbon? What are the three main functions of the United States Constitution? Which African capital lies at the confluence of the Blue Nile and the White Nile? Do you know who was Emperor of Japan during Woodrow Wilson's presidency? And what's the difference between broiling and roasting? And how many martinis does Annie Avedison have to drink before she can't answer any of these questions? Well, the answer to that, of course, we'll never know, because these days, God bless her, she can only drink one. All right, so, you know, did you answer any of those? Were you able to answer any of those? Why weren't you able to answer at least some of those? Did you answer all of them? If so, give me a call and you can do the next podcast. Are, are we undereducated? Mm, possibly. Do we receive a well-balanced education? No. Is creativity really encouraged anymore? Across the board, not just in the elite schools? What happened to all the debating societies? That was such a wonderful part of school life. You know, why are we producing medicated conformists? We need to have free thinkers in love with cosmic creation. You know, I have my own theories about this, as, as do you. But just because we have a population out of control, it doesn't mean that it actually is out of control. We have lost control over our lives. And that's going back to the beginning of the podcast. That's what people are coming in with. I've lost control over my life. How is that? Yeah. We'll talk about that in a minute. What was the other one? Oh, yeah, manipulation. Well, yes, we're manipulated. Of course we're manipulated. But do you believe mainstream news is accurate? Do you believe it's fair and unbiased? I don't know. Do you take medication with 30 plus side effects up to, but not limited to, your dick falling off and death? Do you believe that engaging in warfare is necessary, even, dare I say, honourable? In other words, do you condone murdering one set of people, people your overlords told you are evil, to prevent them from potentially murdering another set of people, people your overlords currently favour? Do you feel that loyalty to your party is more important than committing to the betterment of your country? Do you ever question why students seeking higher education are required to start out their adult lives buried in debt? Do you ever ask yourself why on earth are we still discussing what the heck happened on 9-11 when it's painfully obvious that the three buildings, Twin Towers, Building 7, collapsed as a result of controlled demolitions? Do you think that God is a bloke on a cloud and do you think that the Bible is inerrant? Okay, you know, do you think it's okay that while credit card interest rates can be as high as 30%, you only get 2% return on your personal savings account? Have you figured out that every time someone of note tries to change a law for the good of the people, someone gets assassinated or a world event takes place? Do you believe, as did my late Lutheran mother-in-law, God rest her soul, that George Bush, or insert president, is a good Christian man, doing the best for his country, and that the American government would never hurt its own people? Well, my darlings, if you believe all that, you might have your head up your ass. So, are we hamsters on the eternal wheel of woe? Well, clearly, for a great portion of the population, the answer is yes. Why is it yes? It's because we've allowed ourselves to be enslaved by the three great gods. And those gods would be Moolah Dollar, the Whirling Sterling, and the Not-So-Zen Yen. What a crazy world we've created, eh? Oh my God, what shall we do? The sociopaths have all the money, they have all the power, and they have all the influence. Our elected officials, they are not our leaders, they are elected officials, 
they regularly award themselves raises while cutting benefits for we the people and looting our social security savings. In addition, they put their stolen cash in offshore accounts while the number of homeless people increases daily. I don't know what it's like in your town, but I'm horrified every time I drive around Portland or you know, greater Portland in Oregon. The, there's tents everywhere. People have nowhere to go. They're camping up and down the freeways. It's crazy. I mean, oh my God, what do we do now? It's like we're locked in cages in a human zoo. People can't think clearly anymore. And the thing is, you see, we have to understand, we have to appreciate, we let it happen. We did. We the people are the majority and the 99%. And yet we let the scumbag warmongers, the bankers and the pedophile clergy take us for a ride. And it's a ride that we ended up paying for. So how did we let that happen? Well, how many of us out there regularly attended local government meetings? I mean, it's all very well going around screaming about 5G towers going up in your hood, and you should be screaming before you die. Try to scream. But, you know, if we attended those local government meetings right at the get-go, we would have seen those things on the agenda, and we would have been able to question them and make some noise and gather more grassroots support right from the get-go. But, you know, maybe we're too busy, um, uh, somebody sprained an ankle or someone did this or someone did that or it's Saturday night at the pub. And before you know it, you've given away all your power to the sociopaths. How many of us take an active, ingre- you know, an active interest in our school's PTA? You know, how many of you really know the name of your local police chief, by the way, or the mayor, or other city council members? And, you know, how many of you have turned a blind eye when children have told you they've been verbally or physically or sexually abused at the hands of teachers or certainly the hands of clergy, did you believe them? Or did you say it was just a fantasy or you were too scared of the establishment to say anything? Have you ever decided not to vote in a national election? What's your idea of speaking out against injustice or is it not your problem until it reaches your front door? So, you know, again, these are admonishments. It's just we have to wake up to the behavior that has caused this chaotic co-creation. So what happens now? You say, is it too late? Now that we're all depressed and we're feeling powerless and we're anxious, do we let it all crash and burn? Do we lick our wounds? Do we curse at the sky? Damn you, Sky! Well, we could do that, I suppose, but I'm not sure what purpose it would serve. We could look at things another way. It's not a quick fix, but if you're tired of being a handmaid, you'll need more than a Band-Aid, right? Do we want big change? Of course we do. We need change, but we don't need change for the sake of change. Because guess what happened a few years ago when we wanted change for the sake of change without realising why we needed the change? So if we want enduring change, well then, my darlings, it's always going to have to be the big picture first. And we have to start at the beginning. And as a shaman, it's a spiritual alignment issue I'm going to share with you always. None of this is real. It's happening, yes, it's valid, otherwise we wouldn't be doing it, but it's not the only thing that's happening, is it? All points in space and time are the same. We just happen to be focused on this particular story. So we are temporary, individualized manifestations of source energy. This life is one of many we've had, and will have, and apparently we are having them all simultaneously, and yet, somehow, we are fully focused on this one life without letting any of the other incarnations we're having, aka stories we are writing in the book of cosmic experimentation, interfere with this experience. I mean, think about that for a minute, because that is big. And I would say, whew, how wonderful are we? Now, if we can do that, and we are doing it now, what else can we do? Maybe we can find the courage for some self-examination, and God only knows where that might lead. 
Perhaps we'll rediscover our true nature and fulfill our original purpose to recognize each other as fellow cosmic space adventurers and honor each other and creation by bringing into existence a fair and equitable society where kindness and common sense are regarded as virtues and the Disney critters follow us around, la 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 la, la 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 la, and they come and clean our house and do our dishes. Okay, right, okay. Yes, I am getting carried away. Yes, I am getting a little carried away here, but while that is the greater plan, and it is totally doable, we do need to get ourselves out of poopatopia before we enter utopia, and we've got a ways to go. So, tips, give us tips, I hear you say. Give us tips on how to start this process of raising our vibration above the dysfunction of the world, and how do we get from being blighted to being excited, because we have lost that, haven't we? We've lost our sense of awe. Well, first of all, we have to fall in love with the concept of cosmic creation, because we either believe that we're divine cosmic beings capable of great things, or we don't. If we believe it, then we're aligned with an entire matrix of infinite possibilities. And if we don't, well, we're just another human trying to make sense of a world gone mad. I say choose the former, the latter does not end well. Let's start here. Let's do like three little points, okay? Number one, take a few moments each day and every day to sit with the breath and just remind ourselves that we're greater than the story currently being told. We're cosmic souls currently playing a game, let's call it World of Earthcraft. Our individualized character is a human, but our totality is the cosmic matrix. Now just think about that. What is the primary vibration in your field at any given time? Do you really feel like a bogged down human that perhaps somewhere out there, there's an energy of benevolence that will take pity on it? Because if you feel that, forget it, that's not gonna happen. That benevolent energy that created us wants us to recognize our brilliance and stand alongside with it and align with it. And that way we don't have to beg, beseech and buy into all this self-loathing and sacrifice crap. We just go, hey, I'm in the matrix. I've turned on my light. I'm swimming along the golden river or whatever you want to call it. And everything I need just simply comes to me. Sounds simple, and it is simple, but it requires persistence, diligence, and focus, not incense and hocus-pocus. All right, so we're spending every day, a little bit of time every day, going, we're divine, we're cosmic, we're wonderful, fantastic. Now, point two. If something is really bugging you, like it's in your face every day and you can't overcome it, it could be an addiction, could be a procrastination, um, you know, another behavioral habit, Let's make a commitment to deal with it. We can't take on the world and we can't sort out the world if we can't sort out our own issues. So let's put on our big person panties and gently but firmly remove that thorn from our side. And then we watch the dominoes of dysfunction fall, as my teacher back in boarding school used to say. I think there's something in the Bible about take the plank out of your own eye before you try to take the splinter out of somebody else's. And we have to be honest. Things trigger you, find out the root cause of the trigger, move it out. Sort out your own problems, get yourself into a place of alignment and let the spirit pour through you. And then you can illuminate the rest of the world. Another little thing my uh, boarding school teacher would say to me, never will I a victim be for that will block the light you see. I like that. You should teach that to kids. Never will I a victim be, for that will block the light you see. Seeing ourselves as victims of circumstance, of our own beliefs, of anything really, the very notion that we're victimized in any way, it feeds that energy field of threat perception and that assaults us daily. It crashes us, it keeps us out of alignment and as such it's very dangerous, so be aware. Because folks, strange but true, overcoming our problems makes us happy. A little self-honesty, a little self-examination, a little courage, mon ami, and all shall be well. And point number three, I think. Uh, recognize that if you don't write the story of your own life, 
if you are not invested in your own experience as an individual and as part of your collective, you will be a character, perhaps a bit player in someone else's book. And you don't want to read the story of your life through someone else's filter, do you? Of course not. Let's remind ourselves, my darlings, that when we make these pre-birth agreements and soul contracts before coming down to earth, we do so with our highest good in mind. Ergo, your highest good resonates with your tribe's highest good, with your soul group's highest good. So being true to your path is not selfish, it's quite the contrary. So let's dismiss these ridiculous ego-driven notions of sacrifice. It's not sacrifice, it's self-sabotage. So let's step into our true power and do something useful with their incarnations. Let's reacquaint ourselves with our true nature. Let's help others to help others do the same. Let's start that domino effect. Now, here's an example I want to give you of that. And I don't want anyone to be offended. Well, you know, I don't care. You're going to be offended if you want to be offended. This is not meant to cause offense. But this notion of putting others before you, it sounds so noble and altruistic, doesn't it? But it's rubbish. You have to honor the God within you and illuminate yourself and make yourself as vital and as strong and pliable as possible so that you can have a beneficial effect on others. The best example I can think of is mothers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, I'm not saying that fathers don't sacrifice for their children too. They do. But there's something about growing that DNA <laughs> inside of you. And then, you know, if you grow it, you nurture it, it pops out. And don't, please don't be offended, but sometimes I think that, you know, your brains fall out with the baby. Because it's, oh, my child, everything for my child. Well, of course, we all want to take care of our children. We all want to do our best for our family, for our tribe. But whoever convinced us in the first place that we had to deplete ourselves in order to do that? You don't have to sacrifice for your child. You know, the universe is not a piece of apple pie. It's infinite. It doesn't end. It's always growing. It's fluxing. It ebbs. It flows. It contracts. It grows again. It does things that I don't even know what it does. Quantum physicists don't even know what they do. It just, just is brilliant. But it's never-ending. It's unlimited. So never, ever believe that you have to give of yourself or sacrifice of yourself to make life better for someone else. That's indoctrination. If you really think about it, that's indoctrination. And another example I can think of is why we would be indoctrinated like that is this notion that this capricious bastard of a god had one son and needed for him to be tortured and crucified and brutally murdered and because we'd all sinned so much that his blood had to wipe out our debt. I mean, good Lord, if that was my parent, I'd want an apology with bells on. And here's the thing, it didn't wipe out the debt, did it? Because now you're indebted to him. Well, that's what the establishment would have you think. So you see how all this works? You may think you're not indoctrinated. You may think that, you know, ooh, it's all designed to make you powerless. Of course you feel powerless. It's designed to make you feel powerless. What gives you power is remembering your true nature. What gives you power is sitting alone in quiet meditation, clearing the aura, clearing the mind, taking in the glory of the divine through your breath. Cosmic intelligence is Wi-Fi, and it's free through your breath. You breathe it in, it saturates you, washes you clean, and then you breathe it out. And as you breathe it out, you're not breathing out bad stuff. The minute you breathe it in, it's all good. When you exhale, you're sharing the good stuff with everyone around you. So let's reacquaint ourselves with our true nature. Let's step into our power and let's help others do the same. Those three points are enough to get us started. Okay. That was pretty serious stuff. So enough about that. Now I think it's time for do -do 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 -do, a tiny pat of poetry. Let's move on to really bad but occasionally brilliant poetry from a mad suburban shaman. Yes, folks, after a hard day's shamaning, I love to come home, put my feet up, enjoy a nice cup of tea or a small drinky-poo, and write non-peer-reviewed poetry, which I'm all too happy to share with you. I have two offerings for you today. One is serious and one is quite silly. And I've lost the serious one, so hold on. I think it's on this other table. I'll be right back. Here it is. Okay, fantastic. Got it. 
Right. By the way, as I get more accustomed to this podcast thing, the shows will be slicker and better managed and better produced. So, you know, hang it, hang in there with me, people. Okay. All right. This one is called, <clears throat> excuse me. It's not called, excuse me. It's called Club Psychosis by Ani Avedisian. Tranquilizers do not work. Alcohol brings out your inner jerk. Eating too much makes you fat. Street drugs make your brain fall flat. So what, pray tell, is the prognosis for those who visit club psychosis? When the doctor gave my friend a pill, he heard voices asking him to kill. Doctor said, let's try a different tablet. My friend went out and bought a hatchet. This poem is becoming rather gory. So what is the moral of my story? If you try to sort out the right from the wrong, then you might as well stick your face in a bong. If you review your life story from the outside in, you might as well throw what you wrote in the bin. If your mind is locked in dark confinement, the light to seek is cosmic alignment. Thank you very much. Um, a bit serious, but, you know, we've got to look at the serious and the silly simultaneously. I think we all know that we're over-medicated. I'm not saying there isn't, you know, room for all types of medicine. There is. I'm not saying we don't need medication from time to time. You know, it's wonderful to be asleep during surgery, for example. It's wonderful to have painkillers, too, when you need them. But people are going to prison right now you know, for the opioid crisis, etc. Uh, I think we understand that um, Big Pharma is really not doing us any favors and we have to be very, very selective. And the whole point of managing our emotions is, is growth. If we block ourselves from having those emotions and we put a tranquilizer in there or, um, you know, one of these antidepressants, etc., um, without really dealing with why we're not dealing with our issues, we're asking for trouble. I mean, there are cases, I've, I've dealt with cases where people just are, are never going to get there. And yes, okay, fantastic for the med medication. It keeps them safe and it keeps the people around them safe. But I think we need better, better spiritual education, how to manage our emotions, because emotions are vehicles for intelligence. We, we learn from them. We learn what we like, what we don't like and what feels good and what doesn't feel good. And we refine our focus as a result of managing our emotions. We can't say, oh, I can't deal with my emotions, let me take a pill. You, you've wasted your incarnation. Okay, I think you deserve a funny one now. So let me see if I can remember it because um, I don't have it with me. So I like to write poems about aliens um, because I think they're cute. The aliens in my mind are cute. Uh, you know, I mean, I know that the, the aliens I speak to when we do channelings, etc., they're far from cute. They're beautiful. Uh, they're tall and they're golden and they're magnificent. But my little alien, like, you know, Zook, the guy on my newsletter, they're all little and pink and cute. And uh, that's the kind that I write the poems about. OK, so this one's called Three Little Aliens. Three little aliens sitting in a boat. One had a sandwich and one had a goat. The third took out his willy to see if it would float and was promptly castrated by a passing motorboat. Poor little bugger, that was sad for him, wasn't it? All right, well, thank you for listening to my poems. If you think that they're ridiculous, you're right. Um, and, but if you can't sleep at three o'clock in the morning and you have a need for something ridiculous, go to my YouTube channel and listen to all the rest of them. There's a bunch of silliness there, all for you, for all you insomniacs. All right, going to do a little time check here. Plenty of time. Right, so we're on to Q&A, question and answer. Do you have questions about life, the universe, and everything in between? Are you just as confused about it all as I am? Well then, drop me a line and let's share the confusion. Emails, please, to arnie at arnieavidician.com or snail mail to Arnie at P.O. Box 714, Wilsonville, Oregon, 97070. That should be Cosmic Arnie, 
P.O. Box 714, Wilsonville, Oregon, 97070. Just a small request, my darlings. Don't leave the questions on my voicemail because, you know, you some of you tend to go on and on and on and on and, you know, it's boring and I'm going to delete those. But you can write really long ones on the email and I promise I will read those. Okay. This letter is, seems like it's a somewhat frantic lady in Hillsborough, Oregon, who says, Dear Suburban Shaman, I have meditated diligently every day for over a year now. And yes, you were right. Life is better. I am calmer. And the depression has lifted. But I have recently experienced an unexpected side effect, and I'm not sure I'm happy about it. Well, I'm intrigued, Nancy from Hillsborough. Please share the details of your unexpected side effect. Nancy continues. I think I have become clairvoyant. I see things. I see people and I see animals and things out of the corner of my eye. Just for a second and then it goes away. And I'm not making this up and I'm not mad, but I am seeing dead people. Oh, help, can you make it go away? LOL, Nancy. Can I make it go away? You've developed a superpower. Why would you want it to go away? People pay thousands of dollars to acquire this skill and you got it for free just by meditating. Look, love, I understand that initially it can be a touch unnerving, but let's look at it another way, all right? Those people that you're seeing out of the corner of your eye, who may or may not be dead, by the way, they could just be in a different dimensional zone, they've always been there. It's just that you couldn't see them before. And just because you can see them now, it doesn't mean that they can see you or that you need to interact with them in any way. Here's another way of looking at it. Say you go into a, 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 your local mall, okay? There are thousands of people there and you can see them all. But just because you can see them, it doesn't mean you have to go up to each one and go, oh my God, I can see you. What's it like being in the mall? Do you wear easy spirit shoes? Do you have a message for me? No, you're not going to do that, are you? You're only going to interact with the people you do business with and probably that stall that sells the, the really big pretzels. Now, it's the same in the spirit world, minus the pretzels, uh, I suppose. Uh, if someone wants your attention, they'll make it known. And if they do... Don't flip out. Stay chill and talk to them as you would talk to anyone else and then take it from there. Because, Nancy, I suspect all your intuitive senses will sharpen as a result of the meditation and that's a good thing. If you have trouble managing your newfound skills, I can advise you. Or, even better, I'll send you to a trusted medium for some coaching. But for now, please embrace this advancement in your spiritual awakening. Yay for you, Nancy! you now have access to another part of the matrix. And I see here that you're actually in Hillsborough, Oregon. That's, that's not too far from me. Um, you know, one of the best mediums in America happens to live in Hillsborough. Her name is Bev Martin, Bev as in Beverly. Go to bevmartin.com. I know her personally. I can vouch for her. She's really good at what she does. And she's particularly good at helping people who have recently come into their power to negotiate that. And, and she's lovely, a nice sense of humor, and very down to earth. So Bev Martin, um, she's your gal if you're having trouble with this. So thanks for that uh, question, Nancy, because I suspect many people uh, have that issue and perhaps they're, they don't want to talk about it, so this will help them too. So cheers, love. All right, here's another question. And this question is from Maximilian, and Maximilian is in Modesto in California. And Max says, can I call you Max? Thank you. Max says, hola, chaman. Hola, Max. ¿Qué tal? I would like to know, please, he says, if you believe in curses. I have a rash on my body which comes and goes, and it does not hurt, but it is big. I saw a spiritual person who said it is because I burned someone in another life and this is my punishment because they put a curse on me. But they can arrange for me to be forgiven if I pay some money. Hmm, are we seeing a little problem crop up here, I wonder? My wife says I must not do it. Can you help me decide what to do? 
Yes, Max, I can. Your wife is correct. Look, I've been doing this work a long time and I've seen some weird shit in my career, so I can't say outright that curses don't exist. But it takes a unique, specific skill set to weave them, to embed them, and to make a curse stick. So consequently, they're extremely rare. Emphasis on extremely. And Max, you are not cursed. So please don't part with any of your hard-earned cash. And the amount you mentioned in your letter, by the way, is ridiculous. If you have that kind of money, brother, see a doctor. You know? Now, Max very kindly, very kindly sent me a photo of his rash. <laughs> and I think that's a first, okay? Oh, I have no medical training. And as such, anything I say about this means nothing until discussed with a qualified medical practitioner. But Max, this looks a lot like food allergies. And you did say it comes and goes, right? So perhaps reviewing your diet and cleansing the colon is a better option than anything paranormal at this time. Listen up, folks, by the way. If anyone tells you they can clear your karma or remove curses uh, from you for big money, please don't fall for it. It's obviously a con. Yet another reason I want to make the discussion in metaphysics mainstream so people don't fall for this rubbish and get ripped off because they think it's oh, some mysterious voodoo juju that only a chosen few can engage in. I mean, there are things clearly the layperson should steer clear from. That's why you have professionals out there. I mean, you're not going to let a first-year medical student perform surgery on you, are you? But... With a little education and some open, respectful discussion on the subject of metaphysics and spirituality, we can easily figure out what's true and what's woo and what gets flushed down the loo. So thank you for your question, Max. Max, you need enemas, not invocations. Go with God, brother, listen to your wife, and have a good life. All right, my darlings, that's it, I think, for Q&A. There's a couple more, so if we have time at the end, we can look at those. Now it's time for a bit of philosophy and a segment that I like to call a Plato Chips. This is where we share a quote from a philosopher of note. IMHO, in my humble opinion, philosophy should be on every school curriculum because it encourages us to think, doesn't it? To think for ourselves and not to accept as gospel the establishment narrative. And not all questions have answers. Depends on your level of awareness and all of that. And philosophers are wonderful at answering questions with more answers. So, anyway, this week's quote is from Seneca. Seneca lived 1 BCE to 65 CE, and in my opinion, he's probably one of the most interesting of all the Stoics, because he's readable, and he had quite a diverse body of work. Not all the Stoics are very readable. So if you'd like a short introduction to his works, I would recommend starting with his collection of three short letters titled On the Shortness of Life. Like most people in his day, he was trained in rhetoric and philosophy, and he had a very successful, if dramatic, career in politics. Uh, Claudius exiled him at one point to Corsica, accusing him of committing adultery with Caligula's sister, Julia Livilla, and God knows that woman had a reputation, don't know if it's true, but oh, wow. Anyway, later on, after he was no longer exiled, he became an advisor to Nero, you know, the, uh, the emperor who was a narcissist with mental health issues. Ooh, is that sounding familiar to anyone? Hmm. Um, anyway, the reason he became a, a trusted advisor to Nero is because he had previously tutored Nero when he was young. But as we all know, Nero progressively rocked right off his rocker, and at some point towards the end, he was impossible to work for. And Seneca asked him for permission to retire, which was refused. And instead, instead of being allowed to retire, he was charged with conspiracy to murder uh, Nero as part of the Pisonian conspiracy led by General Piso. In short, uh, as we learned at school, they wanted to piss on Nero and to kill the bugger. Uh, but, you know, Nero compelled Seneca and many others to commit suicide. What an absolute bastard. Anyway, there's more to life, um, more to the life of Seneca than just that, but those were the juicy bits to get you excited to study the life of some of the classical philosophers. So here's the vote for my quote. Every night before going to sleep, 
said Seneca. We must ask ourselves, what weakness did I overcome today? What virtue did I acquire? I'm going to read that again. Every night before going to sleep, we must ask ourselves, what weakness did I overcome today? What virtue did I acquire? Now, I think that's very good advice. And I do indeed ask myself that question every night. Some nights I fall asleep before I can answer it, but thank you for your sage advice, Lucius Annius Seneca, also known as Seneca the Younger. Not to be confused with that noted Roman gastroenterologist, Senepod. All right, and now it's on to another section. And I'll, I'll have sound effects by September. It'll be cool. But meanwhile, do 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 do. It's time for the Wizard's Gizzard, a little spiritual ritual that you can make habitual. And thank you. Um, I got quite a few letters from you saying that they enjoyed the Wizard Gizzard. So we'll keep that in for now until you write to me and tell me that you're bored with it. So today's ritual. If life seems dull and plain, then jumpstart and challenge your brain. Let's make a point each day to read about something or learn about something, explore something outside of our area of expertise. You know, it's common to hear people say, well, you know, I'm an English major, I'm an arts major, I don't really understand physics, I don't really understand geometry, I don't want to do mathematics, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, that's not the point. It's not that you're going to make a career out of it. It's just remember that back in the day, we didn't have so many specialisations. Everyone studied reading, writing, arithmetic, philosophy, and the thing that they all called natural science, because ultimately everything is interconnected. And then whenever we study the shapes and patterns that make up our universe, you know, we see that they run through all aspects of creation. You can't study art without understanding geometry. And it becomes sacred geometry when you realize that you're looking at the building blocks of the cosmos. See how that works? And you can't study music without becoming aware of mathematical formulas. Well, we don't, in my opinion, teach the interconnectedness of life forms in our modern education, not to the standard required. I believe there's a reason for that. I think the establishment don't want critical free thinkers. They want indoctrinated automatons. Anyway, jumpstarting your brain can be as easy as watching a four minute video on YouTube. Just pick something unfamiliar, something outside your norm, and start exploring the greater world around you. This is wonderful for the brain because it starts to tickle and it gets excited and it starts to crave expansion. And as you develop new areas of interest, you'll engage in research and that'll take you somewhere else and somewhere else and somewhere else. And in no time at all, you'll be on first name terms with your local librarian. And who knows, those of you who are single, you might even get a date out of it. Librarians are fascinating people, by the way. They don't just put books on shelves. They, they're knowledgeable. So if your life has become mediocre and mundane, learn something new. It puts the sparkle back into the creative process. That's what happens when we get stuck in a rut, by the way. We're not creative anymore. And then our light on the matrix dims and we're not illuminating ourselves and those around us. We are supposed to be cosmic co-creators. If I were to ask you, each of you, to take a day off and write down all the ways in which you have made a difference for the good in the world, I wonder what we'd all come up with. You know, I suspect, as it was for me, and, and I do this exercise quite often, it will be a real eye-opener, and you'll get up off your ass and do something useful with your incarnation. When we get stuck in a rut, we become very, very self-absorbed, and our brain starts to die slowly. So put aside a few minutes each day to explore the unfamiliar, and you'll find a whole new world of adventure. And as you do so, the collective consciousness expands, and together we build a better world. And that's why we're here to rediscover our spiritual sovereignty in whatever realm of experience we happen to find ourselves in. And speaking of uh, YouTube videos, I have about 85 of them on my YouTube channel, so if you enjoy them, please like, share, subscribe, click on the little bell, leave a comment, whatever else you feel like doing. They're all short. I think the longest one's about six minutes. Most are about three minutes. 
And, you know, I don't make these videos because I'm bored and I have nothing else to do. I make them to encourage respectful discourse, to discuss metaphysics, to discuss how metaphysics, which is beyond the physical, applies to our day-to-day -day physical lives. That's what Let the Spirit Inhabit the Humans is all about. And it's particularly useful if you, you know, share these videos with your friends who frustrate you a little bit because they don't grasp common New Age metaphysical spiritual concepts. My videos, if I say so myself, explain them with much humor um, and no fluff. You know, they're all killer, baby, no filler. So this is what I've been devoted my entire adult life to. I'm going to continue doing it till I draw my last breath. So please, you know, do me a favor, people. Watch some of those videos and, and, and share them, and um, you'll have my eternal gratitude. All right, now it's time for a little segment I like to call Tarot A Go Go. Some shenanigana with the major arcana. And today's card is The Magician. Now, FYI, people, for reference, I am using the traditional Rider Weight deck. And I'm using it because it's still the most commonly used and familiar deck. You can use any deck you want, but if you're following along, for example, using the. Uh, <clears throat> deadly nightshade cat people deck of the enlightened lesbian zombie pattern cutters. Don't blame me if you get lost, all right? <laughs> this happens when I do my tarot classes a couple of times a year. I recommend, you know, it's a beginner's class, so I recommend for beginners the Rider Waite deck or the Robin Wood deck, something traditional, and people will show up with these ridiculous decks of cards that I, I don't know where they get them from and what they mean, and they go, well, I didn't get anything out of the workshop. Um, right, well, here we go. All right, less said about that, the better. The Magician, card number one of the Major Arcana, after Zero the Fool. So what do we see when we see this card? We see a young man, he's self-assured though, and with the right hand pointed to the sky and the left hand pointed downward to the ground. In his left hand, he holds a scroll, asking the divine to inspire him and enhance all wisdom. With the left hand, he shares with the physical realm all that he receives from the cosmic realm. One hand to the divine and one hand to the people. He's dressed simply in a long white tunic and a bright red robe. His belt is fashioned after the Ouroboros, the snake that devours its own tail, denoting the eternal cycle of life, of death, of regeneration. And if you look at the table in front of him, it has all four suits of the tarot, the wands, the cups, the swords, the pentacles, suggesting that he has achieved enough mastery in his profession to use his tools effectively and be of service to mankind. But he has only recently been robed and is at the beginning of his journey, perhaps not yet a master, but a proficient journeyman on his way to mastery. At this point in the journey, while he has every right to pat himself on the back and congratulate himself on completing his course of study and surviving his internship, he must take care not to let self-confidence become arrogance. Although he knows enough to be useful, he must be humble enough to seek the advice of his elders as needed. Although he knows enough to be useful, he must remember that his knowledge and power are greatly enhanced by the practice of spiritual alignment. Each morning he prays quietly. Creator, let me teach but never preach. Let me wipe away tears and dispel all fears. May your heart beat through my heart. May your hands work through my hands. May my mind be guided by divine mind, and may I forever seek to be gentle and kind. If any of you live in the Salem, Greater Portland, Vancouver area, and you wish to learn the basics of tarotology, I have an introductory four-hour class coming up on August the 18th. Details are on my website, arniabadissian.com. So I only do this uh, once or twice a year, so it fills up quickly. So if you want to attend, um, you know, you might want to do that sooner than later. Okay, quick time check here. And I think we have time for one more question. Yes, right. 
let's take a look uh, what's in okay all right so here's one from peggy and uh peggy lives in mississippi well it's probably very warm down there at this time of year isn't it peggy and peggy says okay right this whole thing with the meditation he goes suburban shaman i can't focus on meditation i try things pour out of my head things pour into my head all of a sudden i'm thinking about what to make my husband for dinner and did the cat get enough to eat and then i remember something that i learned back in 1972 and then my first boyfriend and what an idiot he was in short i just cannot bring myself to meditate what is my problem and what am i doing wrong okay you know what i hear that a lot peggy don't meditate okay do this instead you know you want an objective look at the mind because those are those little pranksters that lurk in the corridors of your mind you know we talked last week um, or on the last episode about the insidious field of self-sabotage and all of our collective insecurities and everything that tries to keep us off track so instead of sitting down and going oh my god i've got to meditate now for 12 minutes to clear my aura do like a little pre-rinse and this is what i suggest try this for seven days in a row try everything for seven days in a row okay instead of saying i'm going to meditate just sit down as you normally would for a meditation close your eyes and you know breathe remember to breathe through the diaphragm and simply have an awareness of the thoughts that cross your mind don't try to push them out don't try to block them or encourage them just observe the thoughts that are going through your mind are the thoughts connected to a theme are they seemingly random how quickly you know can one random thought generate a chain of other thoughts what's going on in my head what one thought goes here one thought goes there just don't read too much into it just observe oh here's another thought here's another thought you know your mind's trying very hard sometimes uh, to stay on track and there is this field that distracts us all the time so don't force yourself to discipline your mind not at this point just be aware of the flow of thought waves and when your little bell goes off if you're meditating for 12 minutes do this for six minutes okay when your little bell goes off just bring your back uh, bring yourself back into the awareness of your breath and then write down the thoughts that actually came through your head literally after the meditation write them down and on the seventh day or the eighth day just take a look at all of the thoughts that you wrote down all the random things that go through your head it's just an interesting exercise because you see if they're all over the place or if there's a pattern if there's a theme because you're not trying to block it out and meditate you're letting them flow through there's no resistance you're giving them an outlet like a pressure cooker and once you're aware of all the nonsense for the most part that runs through your mind you'll find that when you sit down to meditate your mind is quieter and calmer and you're more likely to go oh here's a random thought let it flow away here's another random thought let it flow away and you'll start to get on back on track with your meditations and you'll be able to maintain focus so try that that works really well all right my darlings i think perhaps time check yes well i think we've done it i think that's it for this week i think we've used up about an hour of linear time <laughs> an hour we will never get back in our lives so all that's left for me to say is gosh i hope you really enjoyed listening to this show as much as i enjoyed making it i'm Marnie avidician You've been listening to Metaphysical Martini, a production of Cosmic Reality Radio, to whom we are most grateful. Until we meet again, let the spirit inhabit the human.
You have been listening to The Metaphysical Martini Show with Ani Abedisian, the Suburban Shaman, a production of Cosmic Reality Radio. Thank you.